Michael, what's the word? Temptation. Temptation? Why do you say that? Well, I'm a strong man, and I can resist about anything except temptation. Where'd you hear that? I, I heard, heard it through, through the, the grapevine. grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Hey, Sam, what's the matter with you? Oh, man. Now, <laughs> I'm feeling a little attacked here. Well, so I'm just wondering, now that you're sober, can you take criticism? It depends on who's doing it. Are they qualified <laughs> to give me criticism? Well, that's the question. You know, I definitely have improved. I, I was so defensive early on, uh, and certainly before recovery, about taking criticism. Yeah. But my reactions to criticism today are significantly different than they were. Because today, criticism has two aspects to it for me. Mm -hmm. Either the criticism that's being delivered has absolutely no effect on me whatsoever because I don't care what your opinion is. What you think of me, it's none of my business. <laughs> right. Or you're not qualified to be even throwing that, uh, right. that criticism at me. You don't know me. But the other one is there are people who do know me and who don't know me really well. And when they criticize me, there's that moment of there's something here for me to look at. Yeah. What is it? Recently, I, I had a, a temper tantrum and it followed a criticism. Greg, my husband, said, you've been scolding me a lot. Well, now this is where it's so hard is with, I, I'm great at taking criticism from strangers. Yes. And I can, I can analyze whether it's something about me or not. And mm -hmm. so I can let it go very easy. But if it's from my wife, <laughs> Yeah. And he said that to me and it wasn't attacking or anything. It was an, an observation and as a little nitpicky thing that I had done. And might have been true. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I said, yes, you're, you know, you're right. I have been. It stung. I had a temper tantrum about it. But a big difference was I went away. I went to another part of our home and dealt with that myself rather than having that temper tantrum with him because Ooh. I was angry with myself in it. And it's like, this does, I don't need to tear this down and make it worse and all that. And I talked with my sponsor about it and I talked with Greg about it and everything's fine. Imagine that. Yeah. And actually things aren't just fine. Things are, are improved because of that communication, which is what criticism is. It's communication. Yeah, you worked the steps on it. You paused when agitated. You called yeah. your sponsor. You prayed and looked for direction and then take a look at it. Do I have a part in this? And if I do have a part in it, then maybe there's something there. If I don't have a part in it, then it's about them. And then maybe I need to be more generous. And the problem, I, it's like I'm so defensive that there's a wall up. Everything is shut out. Like the first wall that had to fall for me to get sober was to admit that I had a drinking problem. People were critical of my drinking. <laughs> just, just a little. <laughs> you said call your sponsor. And I think of having a sponsor as like someone who can see me because I can't see myself. I'm all wrapped up in myself. You know, my emotions are churning and everything. Criticism is being open to it is the only way that I can grow. Yeah. Yeah. And working the steps is really about, particularly for my sponsor, I need to be able to take criticism and not be so defensive that I can't hear. Absolutely. And, and a sponsor is a huge, loving relationship where criticism really is part it of is. it. Well, the reason I bring it up is because we're going to be playing a blast from the past later on. And Bill W. is going to be talking about criticism. So what happens is I can get so defensive that I'm like a time bomb when I hear criticism, and then I can't learn anything about how others perceive me. But on the other hand, it says in the book, we are not dish rags. Um, Don, what? You're wrong, wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong. 
It does not say anywhere in either of the big book or the 12 and 12. We are not dish racks. What does it say? You sent me down a little rabbit hole on that one because the line is we are not doormats. And then I started looking for that. And you know what? What? It's not in there either. Where is it? At least not in the first 164 and it's not in the 12 and 12. When I searched for it, it, what I found, I don't know where it is. I can't find it. But what I found is on page 83 of the big book, We should be sensible, tactful, considerate, and humble without being servile or scraping. As God's people, we stand on our feet. We don't crawl before anyone. Yes. And I think that that has been translated into we're not doormats. We are not doormats. Well, I translated into I'm not a dish rag. I don't know. You look kind (laughs) of (laughs) limp. A little soaking wet. (laughs) So we're recording this over internet software and you can't smell. You know, there might be a little bit. <laughs> I don't of know, but there's, there's those little wavy uh, air <laughs> movement uh, coming off of Get you. Get us yeah. out of this. <laughs> so <laughs> today we're going to chat with Michael J of Sacramento, California. And that's followed by an archival recording of one of our co-founders, Bill W. In 1965, talking about criticism. But first, let's meet Michael J. Grapevine does not accept donations, but you can offer your support by making a purchase at store.aagrapevine.org or by the Carry the Message gift certificates to sponsor Grapevine subscriptions for alcoholics in need. That's store.aagrapevine.org. Order a copy of the new book, Fun in Sobriety, and join us August 22nd for a group discussion. Participate by calling 212-870-3418 with your reflections on Fun in Sobriety, and we may play it on the show. That's 212-870-3418. I just want to sit back and just enjoy the banter between the two of you. I am over here crying. I had to go get a get a rag and keep my eyes dry. I don't know if I can keep a straight face. A dish uh, rag? Yeah, was that a dish rag? It was that a dish grab? rag. <laughs> that wasn't me. I'm not a yeah, dish is rag. It, is it named Don? <laughs> I'm Michael J. and I am definitely an alcoholic. And I Michael. can't stay sober by myself. Uh, I am sober today by the grace of God. My sobriety date is September 24th, 2001. I just love this deal. I do it one day at a time, just like I did in the beginning, just like I think everyone else who's who's stayed sober. I think that's got to be true because on your screen, which people listening are not going to be able to see, but you have an image of Dr. Bob's house. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to comment on what you guys are talking about criticism, though, if you don't mind. Because I I struggled mightily with that. Where I'm at now is if I'm spiritually fit, no matter who's giving me the criticism, I can pretty much handle it because I I understand that the criticism is not judgment. Mm -hmm. That's why I get defensive because I think they're judging me to be good or bad. If it has no consequence, and it really has no consequence, I, I don't even respond to it because if I respond, okay, now I'm resisting. But a lot of times I will consider it depending on who it comes from. And if it's valid, okay, I'll thank them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or I might pick it up later on, you know? Yeah. Michael, so you got sober in 2001. What was going on with you that (laughs) you decided that you needed to do something as drastic as go to Alcoholics Anonymous? That's pretty drastic. (laughs) Oh, trust me. That was major because I didn't think I was an alcoholic. Uh I was so messed up. It used to take me two hours to watch 60 Minutes. Uh, I mean, we're going to be full of this today, aren't we? (laughs) I mean, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because after I just got out of jail and been out of jail for three days and I was walking in the family court because I was going through a divorce. (laughs) This woman who I'd been married to for 16 years was telling this judge all these lies about me. And she didn't feel like those kids would be safe because I drink all the time and put everyone at risk. How dare her? You know, this is the thoughts that was going in my head. Total lies. (laughs) None of this is real. This is all made up. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, but I just got out of jail. So she had proof. 
<laughs> little so, thing like that. Yeah. So I, I, I said, look, I'll show you. If I ever drink again, then I'm willing to lose my rights to my kids. Seeing that I was going to lose custody to my kids was really what made me desperate enough to do anything. Yeah. I was able to, to accept the fact that she and I weren't going to be together anymore. Even though it hurt, I could accept that. But I didn't want to miss out on a chance to be a father to my kids. They didn't, they didn't deserve that. How old were your kids? Uh, I have three, 13, uh, eight, and six. Mm -hmm. My dad was an awesome dad. Uh, he never missed any of our events. My mom and dad were the very image of love. You could walk through the house and feel the love in the front door. And they had five boys and they made sure all of us knew it, that they loved us. So mm -hmm. I wanted my kids, I wanted a chance to be there for my kids and help them. That's where that desperation came from. So even though I didn't think I was an alcoholic, because she had proof, I said, okay, if that happens, if I ever drink again or do any of that other stuff, uh, I'm willing to lose my rights to my kids and I'll prove it. I'll go to AA and get a certificate that I can bring back to court. <laughs> Graduate, a diploma, right? Right, right. Like a diploma. That's what I thought. Yeah, we issue those. Yeah. <laughs> We so, don't so did issue you, those. No, we don't <laughs> issue those. So did you go to AA? How, how quickly after that did you go? The next day. And I showed up at this meeting in this uh, sordid part of San Jose, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was a field engineer. I used to fly around the world doing all this highfalutin stuff, you know. And I show up at this meeting. Man, I saw some scary people. Yeah. They were talking about prison all this other stuff and there's like clumps of people like threes and fives of people kind of gathered together and you know tattoos and all this other stuff i mean really scary and that was the women you should have seen the guys <laughs> <laughs> oh you set that up bro. yeah that, that was really well 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 done sir <laughs> so so i just kept my mouth shut and my eyes open and I wanted to see what's going on. And but they were laughing and stuff. Yeah. So then I got kind of close so I could, you know, do a little ear hustling as they call it and, and listen, see what's going on. And these guys were telling each other these horrendous stories. And they were laughing. They were sharing stuff that I did, but I wasn't willing to share with anyone <laughs> until I <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I get that. But they're sharing it and laughing. So next thing you know, I step in and I start sharing my stuff and we're all laughing. We're trying to out bottom each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was attracted to the laughter. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, I call it the soundtrack now of AA. Oh, that's beautiful. And and no one expects no. that. Yeah. Well, it's not funny. Right. You know, there right. I didn't have a lot of uh, laughter in my life at the time that I walked mm -hmm. into AA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't think it was funny. I thought it was dead serious and and it was attractive to see these people are enjoying them. And their faces are lit up. Yes. somehow or other with <laughs> some kind of weird glow that I, well okay I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because of course i'm taking inventory right <laughs> everybody yes. else's right yeah right uh, of course they tell you don't take inventory but stick with the winners how are you gonna know who the winners are if you're not taking inventory so anyway <laughs> you were talking about the people that were glowing and and that's what i noticed there were people that seemed to be at peace Yes. And they had had the horrendous story that I had, but they were at peace with it. The thing they all had in common was they had sponsors. Mm -hmm. So I got a sponsor and I got in the book. Now, even though I didn't think I was an alcoholic and all that other stuff, I wanted to be at peace. But you can listen better with your eyes than your ears when you're new. What I saw was the result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got a sponsor and I, I didn't really think it. I was an alcoholic until I got through the doctor's opinion. Doctor's opinion, I identified, I had a flashback of those events. And and when I had a flashback on those events, and I said, damn it, this is me. What kind of events? Well, it starts out, it says, uh, uh, we drink because we like the effect, right? Mm -hmm. That's what opened my ears. Because I used to think I just wanted a buzz. 
So I'm slapping myself on the head. Well, dummy, a buzz is an effect. Okay. <laughs> and then it says, we can't distinguish the true from the false. Or alcoholic life seems to be only normal. They're just like pulling me in. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it says, we succumb to the desire again and go through the stages of a spree, emerging remorseful, vowing never to do this again. It's something to that effect. And this mm -hmm. is repeated over and over unless we have an entire psychic change. We're doomed. Well, the flashback that I had, because I didn't like, being drunk at home because I didn't want my kids to see me stumbling around or doing any of that stuff. So I would always disappear. Mm -hmm. And like, sometimes I disappeared for three days or so. Oh, okay. And so after one of those events, I came home and my uh, wife and my daughter were sitting there crying. And my wife was pregnant with our second kid because they had no idea where I was. Mm. I was crying with them because I saw what I did to them. I just couldn't handle it. And I swore to him, I would never, ever do this again. I can't put you guys through this. Um, they believe me because you could see their hopes rise. I believe me because mm -hmm. yeah. when I told them, I, I wasn't lying. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's <laughs> that can't distinguish the true from the false because exactly. in that moment, completely, yes. that is the honest truth. Yes. Well, when we go to bed, we put my daughter in bed and then she and I are lying in bed. I roll over and I look at the clock. It's 145. I said, hey, babe, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go get some cigarettes. I'll be right back. Can't you just wait? No, no, no. I'll be right back. I'll be right. We both knew exactly what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And I disappeared again. So when it said this was repeated over and over, that was the sinker. When I read that, though, I, I was like, I had hope. This book is all about me, and I'm not even at chapter one. I pissed my sponsor off because I was calling him. He he gave me an assignment. It's like the next day. Come on, man. Let's go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Eager sponsees are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, did you have a hard time quitting that last time? No. Right after that, I was done. I haven't gone back out or anything. I mean, I had a powerful spiritual experience reading that part of the doctor's opinion. The mm -hmm. way it hit me, it was a powerful experience. It's like that experience Bill had, uh -huh. you know, almost that white light experience. I was just lit up. I was just overjoyed. Is that the moment that the desire to drink left for you? I would say the, the obsession left right then and there. Okay. But there have been a couple of times I was at a arena football game with my boys and we're watching the game. We're having a good time. And there's some people drinking in front of me and all this stuff. Ah, that didn't bother me. I was like, hey, I'm patting myself on the back, you know, ha ha ha. See how, I'm, how good I am. So I go to the place to get them some drinks and some hot dogs and stuff. Watching them top these mugs from the keg. I saw it and it's like, man, I'm getting kind of thirsty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and and then I just laughed at myself. I said, yep, I'm still an alcoholic. <laughs> I love that. The thing that I just heard you say is that the obsession left you, Yeah. but the thought has come to mind. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing my sponsor told me, he says, uh, Mike, don't start lying to yourself now that you're sober. If you get the thought, you get the thought. And if it gets real bad, just say, okay, I want to drink, but I'll wait till tomorrow. Yeah, you know? tomorrow. <laughs> so, Michael, you've been sober for 20 years now. Yeah. Who the fuck that? <laughs> What's a day in the life of Michael at 20 years sober? I'm always looking for ways to grow spiritually. A few years ago, when I was moving to Nebraska, I was leaving California. I had no idea what my life was going to look like in Nebraska. I had a lot of fear, and I decided to write a letter to God. I just wrote, dear God, and I just started writing about my fears. Next thing you know, he took my hand and started writing his response. So what I've learned is that the will of God won't take me anywhere where the grace of God won't see me through. Oh, that's beautiful. And now what I do every morning, I read some kind of book, Daily Reflections. And I used to love As Bill Sees It. And then I'll get quiet and I'll write. And I write these letters to God. I do that in the morning. It's important that I get really spiritual in the morning because my problems are like vultures sitting on the bedpost waiting for me to wake up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I get deep in the morning. Go ahead. How do you let go of anger? How do you let go when the thing that is wrong is justifiably wrong 
say it's on principle. I need to let go of this. But if I do, it's like I don't care about the principle. Ooh, you're saying, how can I let go of something that I'm angry about without being apathetic about it? Because you said, even if somebody else is wrong, it's me who's upset. And if I don't find a way to let go of something, I can't change. But I want to fight it because, by God, this is not right. So I'm talking about like uh, the war in Ukraine. Yeah. I can't do anything about it. It's very upsetting. Yeah. Where's the place where I need to let go with that? This is the kinds of things that are difficult for me. Well, you're... You're talking to the right person. I've been very active in the community before and after I got sober. There's a lot of things I was involved with, uh, fighting for voting rights, for example, Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, addressing all different forms of discrimination. Uh, This is something to be angry at. Right. It's something to be angry about. Uh, But you know what? Anger never serves me. When I make decisions based on anger or take actions based on anger, I always make it worse. People think that I'm really angry. It's not. It's like, no, I really care. There's a difference. You know, when uh, some people have told me, well, if this country is so bad, why don't you go somewhere else? And no, it's like, I love this country. I, and, and I'll give them an example. I said, do you love your kids? And they'll say, yeah. I said, so when they do wrong, do you just say, just keep doing wrong? Or do you tell them and try to help them? Yes. <laughs> you know, I do it because I care and because I love. And that's the source of all this behavior, but anger is something, it's like a cancer. It spreads and I, and, and it colors everything I do and see and say, and I really, if, when I get angry, I really just back away and slow down and try to get peaceful with it and try, I mean, step 10, and that's when we go back to step 10, right? The spot check inventories, mm-hmm. things like that. You know, it mm-hmm. might be something I need to put off and talk to my sponsor about. And he and I, work together and kind of see what my part is in this and what part of me it affects. Because, you know, the bottom line is we're all powerless. I don't have any power. Okay. So I can't force anybody to do anything I want them to do. I can't just mm-hmm. change things. I can only do what I can do, you yes. know, and, and I have to be at peace with that part. You know, the serenity prayer part of that came to mind. And that was courage to change the things I can Yes, and wisdom to know the difference. And so to me, it's like anger is an alert. As an alcoholic, I can't stay in anger, but I'm going to experience anger. That's going to happen. I'm human. It better serves me to look at my anger and then look at, all right, is there something here that I can do? Mm -hmm. And what I can do about it may seem to have so impossible of a chance of doing anything to change it, but it may just change it because I don't know. Well, that's the part of what I can do. And right. you know, yeah. it's, it's what I can do. I need to do. And what I was thinking as, as we've been talking is that particularly if it's a matter of persuasion, I'm talking to people who disagree with me. As soon as I become angry, I've lost all my power. Yeah. Yep. No more persuasion is going to happen. Now, what are yep. they going to do? They're going to, and now we're fighting their defensive. Absolutely. So the, I need to be on guard for that. And, you know, anger feels powerful, though. Yeah. Oh, our anger is definitely powerful. Oh, yeah. Your question reminded me of a, an AA business meeting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> when we're arguing over principles, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or we're <laughs> arguing whether or not we're going to have cookies. Right, right. That's the bigger <laughs> argument, you know, and they're throwing in everything <laughs> off the wall. Well, if they're not chocolate chip from this place or if they're not fresh, man. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Michael, is there anything we haven't asked you you want to share? You know, I was in a business meeting where there was a big debate over hybrid versus separate meetings. Yes. From what I've learned from just all of AA's history and everything else, we've always taken advantage of whatever technology was available to reach out to this alcoholic who suffers. You know, in the last paragraph in uh, the forward to tradition four, it even talks about it even more. I can, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it said something about modem to modem, this and that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and that came out in like 2001. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My, have we gone? And, yeah. and let's face it, Zoom has made AA grow 
there's been places in the country where, you know, there's maybe five meetings a month or maybe the same three or four guys have gotten together and they're already reciting each other's story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Zoom has opened them up to a much broader perspective. We did vote to keep the hybrid. Good. It's an excellent hybrid meeting. My service sponsor pointed out to me several years ago, one of the reasons he loved the grapevine is that there are so many people in AA who don't get to travel around the country or around the world. So they don't get to experience the flavor, if you will, of AA in all these other locales. But through the grapevine, they do because there are people from all over who are writing about their experiences in AA. Well, look at what has happened with online meetings. Yes. It has exploded so that you can go to a meeting in Japan and Australia and Canada and, you know, Poughkeepsie and, you know, wherever and yeah. get the experience and the flavor of alcoholics who are in recovery or finding recovery um, all over the world. So do we have gratitude for COVID? <laughs> Isn't that a mixed bag? Yes. Uh, I mean, I mean, but really, I mean, check it out. I shared a story with you guys earlier about when I celebrated 20 years and I decided since I was living in Nebraska, I decided to drive to Akron. I was at Dr. Bob's gravesite and I zoomed in to my home group in San Jose where I first got sober. <sighs> You know, so if it wasn't for COVID and all this, Zoom wouldn't have been available. That meeting wouldn't have been hybrid at the time. And I wouldn't have been able to connect with my friends and that I've been knowing for years. And they called on me and I said, I'm at Dr. Bob's gravesite celebrating 20 years. I would love to know what Dr. Bob feeling on take on this meeting right now, you know, uh, where <laughs> AA is right now. And I let the speaker know that Dr. Bob got to hear her chair. That is fantastic. <laughs> Technology, it's awesome. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute joy chatting with you. I really enjoyed this and I was really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, do we sound that scary on the <laughs> No, the voice is in my head, guys. You just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell I don't think I have laughed this much in a while. This is the Now, here's Bill W. in 1965 speaking about criticism, both from without and from within AA. I've edited this clip for time, but not for content. Now let's have a look at this matter of criticism, especially the criticism of AA that is made in the world about us. For years, our society has been amazingly exempt from those usual barbs that are pitched at all movements of any consequence, whether these be social, political, medical, religious. But when this quite usual thing does happen to us of AA, I think we are apt to register undue shock, maybe anger, when people find fault. Sometimes we have become so disturbed that we cannot even benefit by constructive criticism. We are even less likely to be good-natured about criticism that isn't so good, criticism that is slanted or downright unfair. These are very natural attitudes, and I must say they are not widely general among us, yet it is still a fact that many of us do so still react when we are hit where we live. However satisfying these brands of resentment to some of us personally, they make us no friends, nor can they serve any useful purpose. Therefore, to react wisely and in good spirit to all criticism should be our constant aim. Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religion, nor is it a medical treatment, nor does it profess expertise in respect of the unconscious motivations for human behavior. Sometimes I think these facts are too often overlooked by us. Here and there we find members proclaiming AA to be a great new religion, excepting for purely sobering up assistance. We are also apt to underrate medical contributions to our welfare. Because 
Their relatively new art of psychiatry does not get sober great numbers of drunks. We are prone to discount the values of that profession. When we take such unrealistic and negative attitudes, we are, of course, forgetting that we AAs owe our very existence to medicine and to religion. In all our cardinal principles and attitudes, AA has made immense use of these great resources. It is chiefly our friends in these fields who first gave us the principles that enable each of us to live and to grow today. Therefore, the credit of these vital contributors to our welfare should stand very high among us. True enough, we drunks did put AA together, yet its basic components were supplied to us by friends. Here especially our maxim should be, let's be friendly with those friends. Next, let us recall, it is a historical fact that almost every group of men and women tends to become more dogmatic. As time passes, their beliefs and their practices harden, sometimes to the point of freezing. Up to a point, this is a natural process, not all of it bad. Certainly people must rally to the call of their convictions. We of AA are in consequence no exception. Obviously, too, we should have the right to voice our convictions. This is good principle. This is good dogma. But dogma also has its liabilities. Simply because we have convictions that work well for us as of now, it becomes quite easy to assume that we have all of the truth. Whenever this sort of prideful arrogance develops, we become aggressive. We demand agreement with us. We play God. This is very bad dogma indeed. For at us of AA, it could someday become especially destructive. For example, newcomers are approaching us at the rate of tens of thousands yearly. They represent nearly every belief and attitude imaginable. We have atheists and agnostics, people of many races, cultures, religions. Now we of AA are supposed to be bound together in a kinship of common suffering. Hence there must be full individual liberty to believe in any creed, in any principle, in any treatment. Surely these are liberties to be remembered by us. Therefore, never let us pressure people with our individual or even with our collective views. Instead, let us accord to each other that respect and love which is truly the due of every human being as he tries to make his way toward the light. Let us always try to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Let us forever remember that every alcoholic among us is a member of AA for so long as he or she so declares. Why can't alcoholics sing well? They only know one note. Me, 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 me. It's all about me. No, it's about me. It's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.